Let's take a look at querying the database. We want to extract data from the relational database, and so we have to have a query string. That is the, the SQL command that we want to execute. And on the third line on this slide, you can see that we've set up a variable, which is a string. We've called it SQL str. Of course, as a standard variable, it could be called anything you wanted. The string contents is actually the SQL statement that you want. But please note, there is no semicolon at the end of the string. But we are using a semicolon, of course, to terminate the Java statement. So this is going to select every piece of data from the table called service. Now, the way that this is going to work is that we're going to create a statement object. Using that statement object, we shall execute a query that will then return a result set. And so we've also got a variable that's going to hold that result set. We've also got this variable here called call count. I'll tell you in a while why we're going to use that. So we've got the connection, but now we need to set up the statement. So from that connection object, we're going to call the create statement method, which we're storing in here. And then from that object, we're calling the execute query method. Passing as the parameter this SQL statement, we have to use execute query because we're performing a select statement within SQL. Every time you see select as the first word in your statement, then you know that you've got to use execute query. That method is going to use the driver either directly through the JDBC classes or indirectly via the JDBC ODBC bridge to connect or to communicate rather with the database via that connection that you've set up. And we'll send that SQL command to the database. The database management system will pick up the command, will execute that command, and then will return the results of that query via the drivers back to the program and will store an object of type result set within RS. So that all takes place as part of execute query. Again, if there's a problem, it might be, for example, that you've typed in an invalid SQL command, or maybe there's some other problem, perhaps you lose the connection to the database for some reason, whatever it might be, all of that kind of problem could generate an exception, probably an SQL exception, and that will be trapped by the try-catch block. And so again, instead of just printing the stack trace, you would probably want to put in some useful error handling code. So we've got the result set come back. Now we need to make use of it to extract the data from the result set for our own purposes. Again, in a try-catch block. So each of these uh, slides that I've shown so far have, have given different try-catch blocks around each of the code. But it's probable that what you'll have is a single try-catch block for the entire section of code for the connection and for the, the processing of the result set. Now, the first line in this try block is uh, making use of something called the metadata. Metadata is information about the data. So the result set is a set of data that has got, for example, a number of columns in the result set and will have other information about that data that's come back from the database. If we want to know about that data, such as how many columns are there, then from the result set object, RS, we're going to call get metadata, which gives us a reference to that metadata object, from which we then call get column count. And so that will tell us how many columns there are. Just popping back up one screen, you can see that the SQL statement was select star. So that's going to extract every single column from the table. And we might not know how many there are. So that's quite useful. On the other hand, of course, if we'd said something like select column one, comma, column two, comma, column three, from service, then of course we know that there are three columns in the, in the result set, and so we wouldn't have to query the metadata. But in this example, because we don't know how many columns there are, we're consulting the metadata to find out how many columns are in there, which we're storing here, so that down here a little bit later, uh, we'll be able to use it as part of that loop. Well, let's come back to this while statement. rs.next is a very useful method and it does potentially two things. The first thing it does is to attempt to load a row of data from the result set. If there is a row of data, then it will return true. 
If after the attempt to load there is no data, then this method returns false. Putting it inside a while loops condition like this, we know that if it has returned true, that there is another row of data to process, and therefore we can enter the loop and process that row. Now, because we don't know how many columns there are, in this example, all we're doing is just iterating through the data for that row. And for each column, we're going to print out the information. We've got the for loop that starts with the loop counter with a value one, and we'll go up to and include the value of column count. rs.getString will return a string containing the value, the data, held in column i. So this is one way of extracting data. rs.getString will always get that data and return it as a string. We're using here the value of i as the index of the column. The first column in the data set has an index of 1 the second column an index of two and so on and so because we don't know what the column names are we are using the index on the other hand if we do know what the column names are in the result set then instead of using get string i we could use get string and then instead of i we would put a double quote the name of the column double quote and so we're then extracting the data by column name instead of by index and in this uh, very simple example, we're just getting that string and immediately printing it out to the, to the default output stream. And we're doing that for each of the columns in the row. And then we come back up to the top of the loop, call rs.next again. And if there's a second row, that row will be loaded and rs.next returns true. We then go into the loop and process the second row and the third and the fourth and so on. Eventually, rs.next will attempt to load a row and there won't be any more rows to process from the result set, and so it returns false and we exit the loop. In the UK, we have what's called the country code, and that is if you're out in the country, walking through the fields, the golden rule really is leave things as you find them. So if you open a gate, then you close it after you've gone through it. If the gate was already open, you leave it open. Now, similar kind of concept here. If you've opened a result set, then you should close it. If you've opened a statement, you should close it. And therefore, having finished processing the result set, we close the result set, rs.close, and then we finish with the statement, so we close that statement as well. If there's nothing else for you to do with that connection, then perhaps you should close the connection too. It's probably a good idea to do that, because with some of the database management systems, if you leave the connection open, and then your program finishes, it might be that that connection stays open. And so over the course of time, you run the program, close the program, run the program, close the program, and more and more of these connections are left open. And that will cause concurrent connections, and the more of those you get, the likelihood is that the performance of your database will degrade until eventually it will either crash or just be so slow as to be uh, not at all professional. So it's a good idea to keep that connection open only for as long as you need to interact with the database and then close it. Some databases will support quite large numbers of concurrent connections. Others support only small numbers of concurrent connections. So you have to, to consult the documentation really for that database to see what you can do. And of course, you can also build in concepts like uh, connection pools. You've got a small number of connections to the database open in a pool that all the objects in your application are using. So they grab a connection. The connection is permanently open. They grab the connection, use it, give the connection back into the pool. Get string returns the data in the column as a string, whatever kind of value that is. So even if it is, uh, let's say, a person's age, or it might be a count of how many children they have, or whatever it might be. If it's an integer, calling get string will still return it as a string. Now, if you know that the column contains data that is of a certain type, such as integer, then instead of calling get string, you could call get int. So rs.getint, and then either the column index as the parameter or the column name. If you want to insert data, you need to have an SQL string, properly formatted with all the correct values and so on. Again, no semicolon at the end of the string, but we do have a semicolon to terminate the Java statement. 
in this example, we've just used hard-coded values. But of course, in the same way as you can uh, use with system.out.println, the catenation operator to take a string and add into it the value of a variable and then add on to the end of that another string and then another variable value and so on. You can do similar things here. So let's say you've got a variable called ID that has got a value. Then you would put a double quote here, plus, in the variable name, ID, plus, then a double quote, followed by the, the rest of that string, comma, space, single quote, and so on. And that way, whatever value the variable ID holds, you've now inserted it into your string. You've constructed the SQL statement string using variable data. And that's a very powerful concept that you can use through your programs. Now, this is an insert statement. It, therefore, it is not a query. Queries only begin with select. Therefore, using insert means that we're going to execute an update on the database. We're not going to execute a query. Execute update does something a bit different. It does not return a result set. It returns an integer telling us how many rows were affected by the update. I've got a variable here that will be used to store the value that's returned so we know how many rows were updated. Again, a try-catch block. We're setting up the connection, uh, sorry, the statement using the connection object in just the same way as we did before. But this time, from the statement, we're calling execute update. So I just want to stress, we only use execute query for an SQL command that starts with the word select. Every other SQL command that we would use, we're going to use execute update. And we're passing as the parameter that SQL string that's been set up. That's going to send the command to the database via the, the JDBC class or the JDBC ODBC bridge. The database management system will interpret the, uh, the insert statement in this example, will execute it, and then return an integer to say how many rows were affected by the insert. Typically, it would be one. But we're going to store that value in row count. And in this example, we're just going to output that to report how many rows were affected. But of course, we could test that. It might be, for example, that uh, if zero comes back for some reason, that we will we'll report this anomaly to the user. If we're doing some other kind of update, such as a, an update statement, then we might want to report that there were four rows updated or no rows updated or whatever. So we can test the value of row count and do whatever we want accordingly. We've opened the statement, so we should close it. There's no result sets used here, so there's no need to put rs.close. 